All right, we'll get started. I think this is even, uh, we're here at Backcountry Journeys. We're trying a new feature today. I think this is actually being streamed live to Facebook as well. So not only do we have a crowd here, I think we got a crowd in on Facebook. But as always, when this presentation is over, if you want to go back and review it, you'll get a, since you signed up for it and you're in attendance, well, since you signed up for it, whether you're in attendance or not, you'll get a link probably later on today with kind of the, the, uh, in version of it so you can go back and review any things we're going to talk about but today's presentation isn't really necessarily anything groundbreaking uh it's it's sort of my lessons i've learned in making the switch to mirrorless and i'll tell you more about that as we go along but before we get started no we got people from all over wisconsin i'm just reading the comments uh tyrone georgia hope you're doing okay bj uh so yeah, we got people from all over. So anyway, today's presentation is called Making the Switch to Mirrorless and your guide to choosing a new photographic tool. And I, I, I'm assuming that since you're listening to me today that you've got an interest in switching to mirrorless and and uh, or you've already switched and you're just trying to figure everything out. But we're going to talk today about, from my perspective of, of the things that I, I see as the difference between traditional DSLRs and mirrorless. Uh, couple of anecdotes that I'll tell if you've ever been on a webinar with me before, if you've ever been on a tour with me before, you know, one thing's true about Russell. He likes to tell stories. So I got a couple stories I'll tell you along the way, show you a few pictures along the way, tell the stories behind those. As, as always, I want to make this as much of a, of a dialogue as we can and not a monologue. So since I am monitoring the uh, Q and a, and I'm running the presentation all at the same time, if you've got any questions as we go along today, feel free to pop in there and, uh, ask away. And I always like having the, the back and forth during these presentations of, of answering questions. I don't really like waiting till the very end to answer questions, although I will, but I prefer people asking questions in the heat of the moment. And, uh, and that way it's fresh on my mind, it's fresh on your mind and we can, we can do a good job of making sure your questions are answered. So without further ado, it's 1203. We're going to talk about making the switch to mirrorless. And if you've seen me before, you know who I am. If you haven't seen me before, my name is Russell Graves. I'm coming to you live today from Hackberry Farm, Dodd City, Texas. Hackberry Farm is the name of my little farm that we uh, bought and built a house on and just moved in a few months ago. And actually, I think we're going to, I just upgraded my internet service the other day. So one of the problems when you live in the country is how do you get good high speed internet? That's a uh, you know, one of the things we obviously thought about when we came here. And so I was able to work with my internet service provider the other day and they were able to dial up the upload speeds and dial up my download speeds just a little bit. So it's not like living in the city where you have a, a gigabit fiber, but it's as good as we can get here out in the country. And it's, you know, I say as good as we can get, it's, it's plenty good for what we're doing today. So I hope you guys see a little bit of a improvement in the uh, service but if not it's being recorded so if there's a lag time on your end or a little bit you have some trouble seeing me or it cuts out from time to time the final recorded version won't have that so you can go back and look at it uh lori so got a couple of comments here coming in here lori asked a, a question that I'll, I'll go back and get to as we go along and then uh, Kenneth says he's not the, is he the only one not getting sound from what er I hear everybody else? Kenneth, I'm going to answer you right quick. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and answer Kenneth right quick, send him a note just to let him know that everyone else is reporting that they can hear, hear fine. And so uh, maybe he's got a problem with his with his uh, doesn't have his speakers turned up or something. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, talk about that. So I've got a question here from Linda. I got a question here from uh, who else? Did I see one for it. The question disappeared. So I will, if I don't answer your question today, feel free to answer back. Cause I had one question I saw in there earlier and it's disappeared for some reason. But anyway, uh, I'm coming to you live from Hackberry Farm, Dodge City, Texas. I'm going to tell you my perspective on what I've learned so far from switching to mirrorless. I, I think the title of the presentation as it was presented was about my thoughts on the R5. 
and I've got I'm a cannon shooter. I'll tell you more about that later. But uh, it's not just about R5. It's kind of switching to mirrorless in general. And I'll I'll tell you about my R5 as you want to if, if you want to know. But uh, for the most part, it's not going to be necessarily brand specific. It's going to be more format specific. So uh, without further ado, all these pictures you're going to see in here today in this presentation are pictures I actually shot with my mirrorless camera. And they've and they're pictures I've taken on the past couple of uh, backcountry journeys photo tours that I've done. This was obviously in the Florida Everglades of a white ibis catching a crab that we uh, we were able to find right off the side of the road on one of the wildlife refuge refuges we attend there. So uh, I'll tell you the pictures behind the or I'll tell you the stories behind the pictures. Uh, And if uh, if you have any questions about any of the pictures, feel free to ask those as well. So first of all, I want to tell you, if you don't know, and this is kind of going to start 101, I'm going to quickly move past 101, uh, mirrorless camera 101, and, and move beyond that. But essentially, when you ask the question, what's a mirrorless camera, a DSLR has a mirror inside of it and a pinaprism. And when the light comes to the lens, that mirror reflects light up to the pentaprism. The pentaprism corrects it and makes it upright. And then so when you're looking on a DSLR, a digital SLR camera, when you're looking through the viewfinder, you're actually looking at a live image that you see that's just being reflected light coming through the camera. And so essentially, the and, and I'm no technical wizard, but the people who figured out di uh, mirrorless cameras figured out a way to take the mirror out of it. And so that live image that's hitting the sensor, it gets translated onto essentially like a screen. You're watching a TV inside your camera. And so when you watch that, it's a, it's a simulated image. It's not the actual image that you're looking at. And so like the title suggests, a mirrorless camera lacks the mirror that traditional DSLRs have. As far as functionality and the way they arrive at exposure and the way they autofocus and all that, it's essentially the same. The big difference is they figured out a way to take the pentaprism and mirror out. And in the early days, it saved a little bit of weight, but that's all changed a little bit. But first, let me tell you a story and what brought me to where we are today. Uh, the uh, doing, these, doing these photo tours and teaching about photography and, and uh, all the other things I do on this, uh, in, in my business, you know, aside from doing photo tours, I'm also a a commercial and editorial photographer that I shoot a lot of pictures for uh, various magazines and, and ad campaigns and some other commercial uh, companies for commercial use for their internal usages. So I do a lot of that. And, and, you know, the cameras I use, they're, they're tools of mine. I mean, just like I was a carpenter and I have saws and, and hammers and all that other stuff that you use compressors and all that other stuff that you may use as a, as a contractor. Uh, my cameras are my tools. And so one of the things I learned early on that from a business standpoint, and if you're doing it for a business like I am, and this is how I feed my family and send my kids to college and all that other stuff. But from a business standpoint, I learned business 101, you can't always control how much you make, but you can almost always control how much you spend. And nothing was more evident than when COVID happened, you realize how much out of control you are with how much money you make. And so with that, with, with controlling my expenses standpoint, I've always, well, I've never been one who just chases new trends just to chase them. And usually what I do when I buy cameras, I don't ever buy cameras or lenses when they're brand new. I'll wait till other people use them slightly and then they let them upgrade. And almost all the equipment I buy, I buy used. And so over the past couple of years, I've been in a building frenzy. I've bought a farm. I've built a house. I'm building a new studio. I'm building a shop. A building a chicken coop. And so all, I'm spending all this money because I'm my own bank. I'm spending all this money to improve a piece of property and improve another piece of property I own. And so I, I've really been reticent about buying new camera gear. And on a whim last fall, I think it was, uh, or late last summer, I think it was, I found a, uh, I found an app I could put on my computer and I plugged my, my Canon cameras into it. And I, I wanted to get a sense of the shutter actuations on my cameras. And I realized the camera I used the most was at 96% of its expected shutter life. The camera I used the second most was like 180% of its expected shutter life. Still going strong, showing signs of wear, but the camera was starting to wear out. 
I've got, and I've got, actually got it here. I actually bought a new body just for the 4K camera, but this is a, uh, let me turn it, you see, this is a Canon 90D, not a fancy camera, not the workhorse cameras like I'm used to using, but it's still a functional camera. This is actually my newest camera, and it was about 25% of its actual life. So when I buy cameras, I buy them to use. And so with that thought in mind, I just realized to put it in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, automobile analogy i realized i was i was running my car on tires that were probably about to pop i needed new tires or 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 the wheels were about to fall off my vehicles and so uh not can't afford to not be without cameras and i was going to have a camera because i've got five or six bodies that i kind of rotate in and out in in the use but i started seeing doing these photo tours i started seeing these mirrorless cameras and some of the guests were letting me put their cameras on my lenses and try them out a little bit just to see what they were like. And, and I really, I went to Katmai in September and almost everybody there had Sony mirrorless cameras. And I was just pretty impressed with all the things those cameras can do and the images they're, they were able to get and just the, uh, just the resolution of those cameras. And so knowing that my cameras were wearing out, knowing that I needed to buy something new, I started kind of exploring what my options were. At first, I was thinking about switching to uh, Sony mirrorless and nothing against Nikon, but uh, Sony lenses and Canon lenses all mount on this. They twist the same way when they mount. Nikon is backwards. I've never, they're backwards to me. And I never have been able to kind of get that wrapped in my my mind. So my thought was to reduce my learning curve on just how the cameras feel and operate, it made sense to try to switch to Sony. And so I started thinking about doing that. But before, I did, I did my research and realized that for me to replicate the entire Canon ecosystem I already owned, and when I say ecosystem, I mean the camera bodies I had were still good. The lenses I have are are used, but they're still good. They still work well, but it's the little things that I started thinking about, like the wireless flash controllers or the five flashes that I have that I use on on various commercial and, and, uh, and editorial shoots. and. And just all the little accessories I had that were bought for Canon. If I was going to replicate what I owned in Canon and really and do a facsimile of that in Sony, it was going to cost me probably between sixty and seventy thousand dollars. And uh, I didn't I didn't want to spend that much money. So then I started looking at Canon and figuring out the ways that I could buy a Canon and make it fit into with my existing stuff. And just over time, I may have to replace lenses, but for now my lenses will work with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, body I had, that I just bought a few months ago and, and hopefully kind of move into mirrorless seamlessly. So that kind of brings me around to my mirrorless story. And that's why I switched when I did, because the writing was on the wall and here's some, uh, Here's some more pictures. Actually, the picture on the left, I got back from Yellowstone on a photo tour on Saturday night and Sunday morning. I, I magazine asked me to shoot some pictures for a story they're doing. And the picture on the left is one I shot with my my mirrorless camera of the horse coming to a stop. And, it, and then the two on, well, the one on the left of the horse, the two on the right are some pictures I took on an Everglades tour that we, we did. And so these were all shot using the Canon R5 mirrorless. Again, this this presentation isn't specific to the Canon R5. It's just more that uh, it's just more that uh, in general what we'll talk about during the presentation. So I got a question here from Linda, and again, I had another question earlier that disappeared on my screen. And if you ask a question, then I'll answer it. Pop that back on there. But Linda asks. Thinking about upgrading from a Canon 7D Mark II to a Canon R5, my biggest frustration is with, with focus speed and accuracy. Will the Canon R5 improve this to that significantly to justify the expense? I think in short, Linda, the answer is yes, it will. Uh, I've been really impressed, and and this isn't this isn't just with my Canon R5 because just like I get to play with Canon, I also get to play with Sony and Nikon, and Nikon's focus extremely accurate and extremely fast. The Sony's do the same. And so upgrading from a 7D to an R5, although it's going to cost you a little bit of money, in my opinion, is worth the upgrade just because of the, some of the features. And we'll talk about those as we get into this. And here's the real reason I switched. The verdict's in. Can, this is a story from February 11th. So just four days ago, Canon has discontinued all but nine EF prime lenses. And so EF is the mount that Canon 
calls their uh, DSLR lenses and camera manufacturers like Canon and Icon are phasing out the DSLR market. It's just a fact of life. And then they're further developing the mirrorless business. Now, one of the things that I scratch my head about, and, I, and I'm probably am wrong about this, but before I go any further, uh, Jerry says, which I guess if you can hear me, it doesn't matter. Jerry says there's a box that pops up early in the presentation that you need to click if you, to get the audio and if you miss it you need to rejoin the webinar so maybe maybe the one i answered earlier heard the question but one of the frustrating things to me about this about the the move from dslr to mirrorless and i understand there's a few reasons and we'll talk about those it's not it's not available on dslr but i think these cameras because smartphone cameras are getting so good and it, from all the market conditions i see the, the percentage of sales for the DSLR is go, starting to really start starting to slide. And so ca camera manufacturers like Canon and Nikon are losing market share. So they're having to come up with new products and be innovators to keep people buying new cameras. Cause you know, every business in the, is in the, every company is in the business to sell you a new product. And so these guys are no further. So I, I question sometimes whether they had to build mirrorless, but, because they can, they will, and it offers a new product line that they can exploit for several years to come. So, I, you know, I think it's it won't be long before you can't even buy a brand new DSLR camera. Uh, and I made a mistake that it says DLSR. So sorry about that. I just noticed that mistake in my presentation. Uh, but a DSLR camera, I think it's just a matter of time before they're gone. And again, EF Prime lenses, the, those are the uh, those are the pro grade lenses Canon makes they're starting to slowly discontinue those lenses and not offer support, not man manufacture them or offer support anymore. So it was just a matter of time. Either I switched on my own or you switch on your own. Or we will be, uh, uh, we will be forced to switch over time. So Susan just asked the question, will you be talking about the Olympus mirrorless cameras? Uh, they just announced a new model and how do they compare? I will talk about the Olympus mirrorless cameras. Probably my first real introduction into mirrorless and using one a lot was the uh, Olympus about, oh, I guess, probably two years ago, sent me a uh, E, let me think, it's a E1MX, I think is the model number. It's their kind of the pro body uh, micro four thirds mirrorless camera system. And they, they sent it to me for about a month or a month and a half. I actually put it through the paces. Love the cameras. Olympus is if you're considering uh if you're considering switching to uh uh any, any other kind of body system, Olympus has great cameras, and so I really like those things. But anyway, that camera, and I, I don't want to sound like a shameless plug, but I'll share some of it in a minute. But if you go to my website, you'll see a few videos I I've done with that thing. And I did it handheld just to try it out. I did a I did a commercial shoot with the company on a uh, on a side by side. Did a little short film called called uh, well, I forgot it was something like hard work or something like that. And then I did sort of a fun project for myself when I was in Yellowstone. I shot a fifteen minute long kind of mini documentary mini documentary about spring in Yellowstone. And so both of those were shot using those Olympus cameras. So I'm a fan of Olympus. Uh, I don't. I'll, I'll just for full disclosure. I don't necessarily think one camera make is inherently better than another camera make there's those all variations in the tools and as long as you uh learn how to use that tool and you learn how to use it effectively and adhere to the basic fundamentals of photography you can take pictures you can take good pictures of any camera system so uh i'm a fan of 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 the olympus i'm a fan of canon i i can't wait to see that new nikon z9 that shoots uh I'm told 120 frames a second. That's going to be amazing. And here's kind of a side by side I came up with. I just did this this morning to talk about the differences between uh, uh, mirrorless and, and DSLR. And so when you see this, when you see this part of the presentation come up, I'm going to talk about some things about mirrorless that's uh, that's inherently uh, applicable to mirrorless and some that aren't, and then, then we'll go over to mirrorless on the next column. So in general, the DSLRs have a bigger body size than mirrorless. Uh, that's not always the case. You know, one of the things that early on they touted was the compact size of mirrorless. And, and early on that was true, but as, 
as these cameras become packed more and more with features in the in the uh, bigger sensors, the full frame sensors, and the uh, faster processors, the 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 body sizes aren't necessarily that much bigger from DSLR to mirrorless. I mean, they're they they are a little bit bigger, but not not appreciably so. But I, I, I don't mind a bigger body, even though they weigh more. Uh, I, I think I, I like the way they fit my hands better. And so I don't like the small camera with small buttons. I like a bigger camera with bigger controls and bigger buttons. Uh, DSLRs, typically one of the big concerns with uh, uh, mirrorless cameras is they have a shorter battery life. I know I've got a, I've got a Canon 1. D Mark IV camera, and that thing you you charge the battery on it and and shoot a lot with it. I mean, a ton. It'll, the battery will last a couple of weeks, and uh, before you have to recharge it, and that's not all the way to empty, but that's before you have to recharge it. On on some of the tours I I do, I've seen some of the people that have to literally have to change batteries about every half day because of uh because the mirrorless cameras just go through batteries so quick. And there's some ways to mitigate that battery loss. I mean, one of the things I've made it a practice to do all along, and I've seen a few questions come in, and I'll get to those as we go along. Uh, I try to make it a habit, even on, on my DSLRs, just to turn the camera off when I'm when I'm using it. Uh, and then another thing I do is I try to keep the screen on the back of the mirrorless camera, instead of having the screen turn out where I can see it all the time, I'll fold the screen back in. So that's not always on. And, and, and so the screen's not always displaying something and that helps med mitigate the battery usage on the mirrorless cameras. Uh, DSLR cameras can't use mirrorless lenses and I'll get to the opposite of that here in a minute. So my Canon camera, if I buy a new lens, that's made for my mirrorless system. Uh, I can't use that, that mirrorless lens on my, on my DSLR camera. Now I could be wrong because I did look this morning to see if you could find an adapter. I didn't look a long time, but I, I failed to find an adapter where you could use those mirrorless lenses on a DSLR body, but I might be wrong about that. So if I am, correct me. A DSLR lacks that. And you remember this, if you're around in the early days of word processors, when you heard this, this term come out, what you see is what you get. And so I remember when the day came when you could kind of design what the font looks like and, and, uh, and design the size of the font and all that stuff and be able to see it on your computer screen and be able to, to do your layout on your computer screen and not just put rote words where you couldn't see what they get in the end. But so like like word processors of old, uh, DS, mirrorless cameras have a what you see is what you get functionality. When you look through the uh, uh, screen at the image that you're looking through, when you shoot mirrorless, you can actually uh, adjust the exposure and see how making the aperture smaller, changing the ISO or increasing or decreasing the shutter speed actually affects the image. Now, with that said, that may be a good thing, but I don't know that that's the best thing in the world because with the DSLR, uh, I, I kind of think the the, uh, the images are brighter and they're more, it, it, maybe it's because I've used them so long, I haven't trained my brain to really see the world through a, my mirrorless camera like I did on the DSLR, but still, even though it lacks the what you see is what you get functionality, one of the things about not being able to see what you get unless you look at the back of the camera is it just teaches you to learn about photography and you learn about it so that way you can predict what lighting conditions are going to do and predict what a picture is going to look like before you ever see it. And that to me, that's a good thing to know the nuances of photography enough to be able to visualize in your brain what a picture is going to look like before you even take it. You shouldn't have to always rely on looking at the back of a screen and to try to figure that out. Uh, so a couple of comments here before I go any further. BJ says he likes larger buttons too. It helps the older folks see it better. That's a good point, uh, BJ. Uh, and then Kent asks, what makes the R5 cost so much more than the R? And is it worth it to an amateur photographer? You know, that's kind of an open-ended question, uh, Kent. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I know is the R doesn't pack as many features and doesn't have the amount of robust features that the R5 has. And so uh, is it worth it to an amateur photographer? You know, it kind of, it kind of goes back to where your level of pain is. That's a hard question to answer. And then uh, B 
BJ asks, what file formats do mirrorless take? JPEG, RAW, or TIFF? TIFF is, is uh, I don't know that any of them take TIFF. I might be wrong about that too, but they'll definitely take RAW and JPEG. I always shoot RAW because with by shooting RAW, I've got the ability to output in whatever format that Lightroom will let me form output. So in other words, if you shoot on JPEG, you can't convert it back to a RAW. But if you shoot everything in RAW, you can convert to a JPEG, a, a DNG file, a TIFF, whatever the whatever the file format du jour is for that particular time, you can output to that. So I always shoot in RAW, and the mirrorless cameras will definitely let you shoot in RAW. Robert says he just picked up a Z9 and lots of learning to do, but he's pretty impressed with them the first outing. I, I knew I knew you would be because those look like impressive cameras. I mean, literally. We live in the good old days of photography right now. I don't know that uh, the uh, opportunities for us as photographers have ever been greater, and they just keep getting better and better and better. And so I'm excited about that. This is my opinion here. This next bullet point mirrored viewfinders, like you'll find in a D D DSLR, are better in low light conditions because when things start getting, uh, when light starts getting low, you start seeing kind of that digital grain introduced into the viewfinder on the, on the mirrorless cameras, but you don't really get that when you're looking at the actual image through a mirror and they don't have any kind of lag. I mean, so aside from the mirror slap, you're, you're able to see a uh, continuous motion through the viewfinder with, with mirrorless cameras. Uh, and it varies with the different bodies. There's, there's a little bit of lag. I mean, I can see it even on those R5 that I shoot. You can see a lag, and so in other words, when you're when you're following the action, you may get behind the action a little bit because the the, the way the mechanism of the shutter and then the way it's having to process all that image info, it's not instantaneous that you see it. I mean, it's, there's a there's a noticeable lag, and again, with different cameras, the lag becomes worse. But I think some of the newer mir mirrorless cameras coming out address that, like the R3 and probably the Z9 address that, where you just don't have any any lag at all, or if you have lag, it's so imperceptible you can't tell it. But here's the bad thing about DSLR is because of physical limitations, just the physical limitation of that shut, that mirror having to go up and out of the way to expose the sensor and go back down and do that multiple times, the, the frames per second ultimately max out. So you, and again, you can't fight physics on that just because of the, the limitations of how fast they can make that mirror go up and down. And, and, you know, frames per second is all dictated from the fastest, shutter speed the camera is able to shoot so if you get a like a canon 1dx mark 4 i think it is it claims to shoot 20 frames per second you're not going to get 20 frames a second if you're shooting one tenth of a second just because of you know you gotta mirrors gotta go up you gotta wait for the camera to do to do the exposure and then the mirror goes down and over and over again so because these cameras typically max out at one eight thousandth of a second shutter speed that's the fastest they can go. And it just the, you can't rewrite the space time continuum to make it go any faster. So they do have limitations. On DSLRs, the autofocus system on just about any DSLR you buy today, whether it's the low end consumer model all the way to the high end DSLRs, they have solid autofocus. They've kind of figured it, the manufacturers have figured it out and uh, they have the solid autofocus all the way throughout. And then DSLRs, of course, shoot video now. They'll shoot 4K like I've got here. And then uh, overall, they're a little bit less expensive than mirrorless cameras. And so mirrorless, conversely, to kind of go through each point and tell you a little bit about mirrorless, uh, on average, the mirrorless are smaller and lighter cameras. They, uh, you know, at first when they started coming out, they were they were a little bitty. You know, they were like, Here's my phone. So the oops, you can see my beat up case there. The uh, the mirrorless cameras were, you know, even though you put on the big lenses, were fairly small. And is so from a from a a, a a compact standpoint, they were great. Even that Olympus camera, that Micro Four Thirds that I that Olympus sent me to use for a while. One of the great things about that is when I would take it on an airplane. I mean everything would fit in a case that was just not, I mean, about that big. I could actually put, uh, they sent me a, a 300 millimeter F4 lens with a 2X converter 
and then you do the micro four thirds conversion, which I can't remember exactly what is off, off my off the top of my head, but you had like, you know, 900 or 1,000, 1,100 millimeters effective focal length in a package that was that big. And it was awesome because when I would carry it on a plane with me, I could actually, didn't have to worry about putting an overhead bin. I could slide it under the seat in front of me. It was that small a package. Uh, but that's starting to change. You know, there's there's not my, uh, well, I'll show you right now. This is an R5 I've got right here. And let me get it lined up right. So that's an R5 camera. And so the size of that body isn't much difference at all than this uh, than this 90D that I have right there. So even though they tout them being smaller and lighter, they're, they're getting to a point where they're not necessarily that much smaller. Oops, went one too far. Dad, come on, hang on. Sorry about that. Let me go back through these. So while I'm going back through to catch up, John asked the question: Is mirror shutter shake the biggest factor? And I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, John. So you might uh, clarify that a little bit more, and I'd be happy to answer that question. I'm assuming: Are you? Is it a bigger biggest factor? In, well, I'll let you clarify the question, and I'll answer because I don't want to assume that I know what you're saying. Uh, but feel free to answer that. Ask that question again, and I'll answer it. Uh, even though DSLRs typically have longer battery life, like I mentioned earlier, battery life can be mitigated one by just using common sense practices. Going in there and turning the G going in these cameras and turning the GPS or any kind of wireless or Bluetooth settings off until you need it. Uh, making sure that the the viewfinder getting comfortable enough with your camera where the viewfinder on the back of the camera you flip it around and or turn it off so it's not using batteries and then when in between shooting just make sure you turn it off but i found with that canon r5 because as you see i bought this uh this battery grip with it i like the battery grip for a couple of reasons one instead of using one battery you can put two batteries in it and i found i can shoot a whole week of heavy shooting and then this uh, this camera, or the batteries in this camera will last me almost a whole week without having to switch them out. And then another thing I like about these battery grips, one of the things that people tend to forget about these days is vertical shots. Everybody wants to shoot in horizontal, but if you shoot vertically, all the controls are right there. You've got a shutter button there. And then all the controls are replicated on the back of the camera down in here. So I can, I can operate this camera vertically as well as horizontally and and all the uh, controls replicate itself, but that's the same as in a. That's the same as in the uh, uh, DSLR. You can also buy those battery grips. I'm a fan of them, but the one thing that they do that they help mirrorless on is they help extend the useful life of of the batteries and how long you can shoot before you have to change batteries. So I mentioned earlier, you can't use mirrorless lenses on a DSLR, but this asked Linda's question from earlier, and I've been purposely holding back on that question, Linda, because I knew what I, would, I would address it. Uh, so they do have a legacy lens compatibility with an adapter. So one of the things that, that I was glad I got to try out on, on, on a guest camera is uh, I got to try out my, my big 500 millimeter F4 lens on a Canon R5 a year ago. And... If you can see this, that little middle piece right there, that's an adapter. And so it's just a, it looks like an extension tube. It's just a clear tube, but correct me if I'm wrong here, but one of the things these adapters do, one, is help able to, the mount's a little different from the, from these uh, R mount lenses to the EF lenses. So it, it converts that. But the other thing it does is it has to move the back of the lens on the new lenses away from the, the uh, sensor to replicate the same focal length that they had in mirrorless cameras. And that's getting a little bit outside of what I'm able to explain succinctly. But I understand that that if, if when they built the new lens mount and they built mirrorless cameras, Canon and the other manufacturers had to figure out a way to move the, the, the old legacy DSLR lenses out away from it so it could, again, replicate that same, same shutter, shutter length. But that... Adapter on mine was 99 bucks. It's well worth the money uh, in all of my lenses that I had before. And I've got lenses from 
the 15 millimeter fisheye, I probably have 10 different lenses that I can use on the on the Canon R5 or, or any other R mount mirrorless Canon that I buy. I can use all my old lenses on that. So back to my story earlier, it saved me from having to go out and spend all that money to replicate lenses when for $99 I could use all my lenses just the same. Uh, okay, so John clarified. Uh, John said he heard that they were going to mirrorless to reduce the shake created by the mirror. Is that less of a factor now? Yeah, I think so, John. I don't, on all of my DSLR cameras, I don't, I don't know that mirror shake was ever a problem in the overall sharpness of any picture I've ever taken. I know you get to a point if you're trying to shoot something really slow shutter speed that that mirror shake can, can, uh, can cause some vibrations in the camera, especially at really, really high magnifications like if you're shooting macro. But almost all mirrorless cameras I have, I mean, not, almost all DSLR cameras I have have the ability to be able to, to uh, uh, raise the mirror and then you can take the picture after that and it you can mitigate that shake in it. Uh, Joanne asked the question. She's taking a two-year postponed trip to Africa this June. Congratulations. And she shoots with a Nikon D850 and 750 and a 1-50 to 600 Sigma. Don't want to carry two systems, but feel like it would be smart to take a mirrorless camera with me. Not that I'm ready to fully switch it. With the adapter, let me use the Nikon lenses and still focus as fast. Uh, the short answer to that is, yeah, I think it will. I used, in the one I, the example I did on the Everglades trip, I had a guest that brought a the Nikon Z system with them, and they had an adapter, and they weren't using it that much. Uh, first, they didn't have it optimized for the settings, so I, I, I went ahead and optimized their settings for them, so it would it would respond fast when you're shooting birds in flight but i i just put my card in it and shot a few pictures and they had a legacy uh i believe it's a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom on that and i found it to be really responsive in how fast it focused and uh just shot tack sharp images every time i shot so i think you're going to be okay if you choose to uh to bring an adapter and use your old nikon lenses Okay, so Lori asked the question. A lot of good questions coming in. Uh, clarify that lens compatibility is with full frame sensors, and what about compatibility with crop lenses? So I, that's what I don't know, Lori, because I don't have any expense experience with that yet. So maybe someone else here can can chime in and let us know what the what the uh, if you've got a crop sensor body, will the lenses work on that? I'm assuming they will. They'll just be cropped automatically, but I don't know that. So. My R5 is a full frame sensor, and all I know is that my DSLR lenses I've been using with the uh, with an adapter work well on that. But if you use like one of the Canon uh, R cameras, I think is the the original mirrorless. I'm not sure if that'll work or not. So, uh, Irene says she hates her R6. She shot a rugby game last week. The RF1 to 500 lens. And they were all underexposed. The meter showed I was overexposing. Have you ever had this problem? Yeah, if you shoot enough outdoors, uh, Irene, you're always going to have that problem because the camera won't always get the exposure right, whether you're using mirrorless or DSLR. And so one of the things I teach on another webinar, and feel free to uh, follow up with me after this. I'll give you all my contact info. I'll help you kind of work through that problem because these cameras are smart and they're capable, whether you're using DSLR or mirrorless but they can't always get the exposure right. So I, I would be willing to bet it has less to do with being an R6 and more to do with the conditions, no matter what camera you use, they, they might've done the same thing. And so you just got to learn how to think past the, what the camera's recommended, particularly in outdoor situations and understand how to override that. And uh, that may fix your problem. Uh, Steven says Nikon adapters work. And then Al says, do you have any experience with the R3? I've got limited experience. I have used one before, but I only was able to use it for a couple of hours. I didn't have it for the a few days. But what I've seen, Al, about the R3 is it's a pretty capable camera. Pretty amazing what it can do. Now, I'm probably going to switch switching over to R3 because, I, and I'm looking at history and I could be wrong, but when Canon 
first came out with the EOS cameras back in the 90s. They came out with the EOS 5, and then they came out with an EOS 3, which was kind of their uh, their real robust kind of part pro level uh, film camera. And then they came out with the ES, EOS 1. And then so when they all switched to digital, it kind of went in the same pattern, a 531. And now that they're going to the mirrorless, they came out with the R5 first. That was the real capable full frame. They came out with the three next. So I'm holding out for, I think they're going to release an EOS one. And so that's the camera system I'll ultimately adopt when it comes down to that. A uh, few more questions come in before I continue. Okay. So this answers, uh, I think it was Joanne's question from earlier. Patricia says she has a new Nikon Z7 uh, two with the adapter. And she says she has no problems using her DX lenses on that uh, camera. And I guess I should try it on mine because I've got a DX. I mean, I've got a uh, a lens that's made for the crop sensors on my camera. And I guess I should try that out too. And then Carolyn says she has a DS, Nikon DSLR looking to buy a mirrorless. Any recommendations on the brand and model? I would just try to stick with the 9. I know those Z7 are nice cameras. The Z9, if you can swing the bat on the Ford, one of those are nice. And so... I would, I, if you're comfortable with Nikon, I'd continue with Nikon and not try to switch the whole thing over yet. Just buy adapters so your lenses will fit. And then, uh, Robert says that the Nikon Z you can set to DX mode for DX lenses and you'll get vignetting in full frame mode. That makes sense. Yeah. So, it, so in other words, if you use a DX lens, on a full frame, you've got to make that setting within the camera for it to be able to to use that lens without the vignetting. Essentially, if you've got a if you like like my Canon, if I use my crop sensor lens, my wide angle lens on a full frame, I, I lose the ability to to be able to zoom way out because I get that vignetting. So yeah, I guess it would work the same. Uh, so uh, thanks for those thanks for those answers on you guys when I didn't have that answer earlier. So I really really appreciate that. You are making some great points. Uh, one of the big benefits of mirrorless, even though on the, what you see is what you get function, you can do, you can do exposure simulation, see your histogram and, and, uh, make exposure changes all in real time and see what it's going to look like in the end. The, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of the histogram, having seen it in the, uh, inside the image at some point, the way my brain works, I get, you get too much information. I'm kind of a, I'm sort of a fundamentals guy when it comes to photography and, and that I just kind of do the same thing over and over and over again because it's muscle memory for me I, and I can get it right on about 95% of the time. And so uh, I like to, I like to, and that's a, another benefit I didn't put. You can, you can see as much as you want inside your viewfinder or as little as you need to inside your viewfinder. So with, with, with a uh, mirrorless, you can actually customize how much information you see on the screen when you're looking through the camera. And I really like that because I just try to customize mine where I can see the ISO shutter speed aperture, just the basics. And I can move on from there. But if I wanted to see more information, I could, I could do that as well. Uh, and then although getting better mirrorless view finders still have a bit of a lag and I can see it in my R5 when I'm shooting pictures really fast. It just, what I'll do is if I'm shooting, let's say I've got a bird flying past, and I'm trying to follow it by the end of the sequence, the bird has already flown past and I just can't because there's that little bit of a lag. I'm getting behind that bird each time, just a little bit. And after a while, I just can't keep up with it. Not because of my physical limitations, just because the, I can't, I'm looking through the viewfinder and the viewfinder can't keep up because there's a little bit of lag every time I take the picture. But a big side is theoretically there's no limit to the frames per second. It doesn't because it's all software based and it's all electronic based on how it's recording the image and how you're seeing the image. Uh, I guess the sky is ultimately the limit on how the frame, frame rate per second. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that new Nikon has 120 frames per second. I'm guessing when the Canon E1 or R1 comes out, uh, it's probably going to be the same way. You're just going to be able to, to do, you know, an extreme number of frames per second, whether you need it or not, that's kind of debatable. But the fact that you can, and it has that tool in it, by the way, 120 frames a second, if you don't know much about video is there's three standard frame rates in doing slow motion and video, 60 frames per second, which isn't super slow motion, 
120 frames is pretty standard, and then 240 frames per second is the really super slow mo. So you, so essentially, you're shooting slow motion video when you're shooting these these uh, these high frame rates on these mirrorless cameras. But uh, on the uh, like the Nikon Z that that to get that 120 frames per second, you're shooting the JPEGs, but I, I don't know that that makes much difference at all. And then uh, while the mirrorless cameras are getting better, the autofocus systems aren't equal across the board in the, in, the, in the equipment they offer. And I think because the technology is relatively new, you can still buy some of the original mirrorless cameras that came out that Canon introduced. And the, and the older Canon cameras aren't as good as the newer Canon cameras as far as how good the autofocus systems are. And that's a little bit different on DSLRs. I mean, you can buy a Rebel that has a, that has an autofocus systems within an inch of Canon's highest end autofocus system. So, but mirrorless are getting better every day. Steven says that 120 frames is a severely reduced resolution, but that part there, Steven on the, on the R9, I mean on the uh, Z9 on the Nikon, that's just the introductory resolution because you know, it's going to get with each iteration of those cameras that come out, it's going to get better and better because technology just tends to improve. And then the mirrorless, like the uh, DSLR, they shoot video. One of the things that attracted me to uh, the R5 in particular is the fact they'll shoot 8K, 8K video. And I know other cameras will shoot 8K video, but this is one thing you may not be thinking about. By shooting 8K video, I can go in and pull a, a still frame out of that video and be able to use it as a steel, in addition to having the video as well. Now it's not to the point where I'm shooting video all the time and just pulling stills out because that's a little bit of work to go do that. I still prefer shoot, to shoot still pictures, but I can. One of the things and I should have put a picture on here to show you what I'll do a lot, especially with the GoPro camera is I put GoPro cameras underwater a lot and shoot them in their 6k resolution. And then I can go through and instead of if so, instead of me having to be underwater to, to press the button, I can put it underwater for fish, shoot video, and then go through and just select still frames out of the video and be able to use them. And so since I can do it with the GoPro, I know I can do it with this with this 8K uh, mirrorless. And by the way, when you shoot video on these mirrorless, you've got full functionality of the autofocus as well. And uh, I really, really, really do like that. But here's the bad thing. Overall, they're more expensive. And I think they're more expensive. I'm not going to say they don't have more features than DSLRs, but I think in a lot of ways they're more expensive because they can make them more expensive and they know there's some demand for them. The manufacturers know there's some demand for them. Uh, and so they're going to make them more expensive to give you an idea when I bought my, although I told you earlier, I try to buy cameras used. That's not always the case. A few years ago, I bought that with Canon 1D Mark IV camera and I bought it brand new and it cost $3,600, I believe. And that's exactly what the R5 cost to buy. And so the R5 has got more technology packed in, but it's not a tougher camera and it's not weather sealed like those 1D cameras are. And so you're starting to see that, that I don't know the term it's called, but the, well, it's, in, it's an inflationary term, but it's kind of an uphill price erosion where instead of technology making things cheaper, the technology is actually making things more expensive. And so the Z9 is what six grand, sixty five hundred dollars. The uh, Canon R3 is about the same price. The Sony A1 is about the same price, and so now I think we're in an arms race because they're packing more and more technology into these cameras. They're thinking, well, we and they know there's a demand for it. They're thinking, well, we can ask more money for it, and it's uh, you know, probably going to buy one. I won't buy them new, but it's it's uh, it's a little obscene to think that. Oh, by the way, that 1D Mark IV I bought that I mentioned when I paid $3,500, $3,600 for it, you can go on KEH camera now and buy them slightly used for probably four to $500. And so that's how quick they lose value. And so the manufacturers, it's their right to, I'm not, I'm not arguing the free enterprise system and not saying it should be any different, but they, they, they know they're going to offer these cameras. They're going to try to get, a, extract as much, uh, money as they can out of the consumer at that level knowing that these cameras they get obsolete within a couple of years time i say obsolete from a technology standpoint cameras still work great but uh uh i'm, I'm anxious to see what the mirrorless cameras once we've got a 
a long history of their, their value on the used market. I'm anxious to see what they're going to look like. Uh, Nick asked, is noise a big factor in higher ISOs on the mirrorless? I, I really haven't seen that, Nick. In fact, I think uh, on the camera I'm using, I can't speak for all the cameras, but it handles high ISOs pretty well. In fact, that picture right there on the left of the horse, uh, I actually shot that one at 3,200 ISO. And when you zoom, zoom in on it, you can see noise. Noise really doesn't bother me. That's just all part of it. But when, uh, you, I mean, you can see noise when you zoom in on it, especially if you get real critical. But that that picture will probably appear quarter page in a magazine. You won't even notice the, no, the noise at all. All right. Well, I kind of go through this and get, catch back to where I was at the end. Uh, if you have any questions, it looks like we got about nine minutes to go. I'll go over if I'm not done, finished or not. There's a stick with me. There's a couple of things I want to share with you at the end where you can get a little bit more information if you want to. Uh, Definitely not saying you have to, but you might may be interested in some of the things I want to tell you. But if you have any other questions as I as I go through, I'm back to where I was. If you have any other questions, feel free to pop them in. I think we've had a lot of great questions today. And uh, just another picture, show and tell. This is a shot I took in a Yellowstone at the, at the upper geyser basin of a herd of bison feeding along the river one morning. And that was shot with the – all these were shot with the R5s, by the way. Not to say you couldn't get this picture on some other camera. You can, but this is just what I have, and that's why I keep saying what I use. Then the picture of the coyote on the left, I actually shot that picture uh, last week when we were on the Yellowstone in winter tour. And then, uh, well, the white-tailed deer in the lower right that was taken near my house here, but the, but the uh, uh, egret that was taken in Florida Everglades. Then these are a couple of pictures taken off the uh, Yellowstone trip that we just did. Bighorn sheep and then a big pregnant coyote on the left. She's in good shape, good and healthy. But uh, yeah, so one of the things with the R with the R five, and again, I'm not. I don't want to sound like a Canon commercial because the the Z seven two and the, and the Olympus they'll all do the same thing. But one of the things that I've really noticed. Uh, from my uh, Canon cameras I was using when switching to the R5 is just the accuracy of the autofocus. I was telling my wife this the, the other day, I used to, I used to take a lot of pictures just for insurance purposes. Cause I knew the autofocus systems, you know, you'd hit some, you'd miss some. And uh, one thing I did mention in the benefits, cause I don't know if it's universal against all cameras, but with the eye tracking system that you can set it to people or animals and the, with the ability to track eyes on the subject, I, I found out I don't have to shoot as many pictures anymore because the autofocus is so much more accurate than it, than what I was using previously. And so uh, in the end, my whole thought was, was this, and I, I don't really, I don't mean to sound self aggrandizing when I say this, but you know, I am a professional photographer, so I have a, I have a capacity to shoot well composed, well exposed, creatively composed images and and get them right every time while well, i was doing that with antiquated equipment and so my whole thought which made me justify going ahead and spending some money was if i can do that good a job with my old cameras how much more capable are these newer cameras with the new technology and the new softwares and the new autofocus systems how much how much better will that make me able to do my job and so far uh i'll tell you it's it's been it's been amazing how how much my keeper rate has improved. And I always had a pretty good keeper rate, probably probably 70% on fast moving stuff I could get in focus and keep, but there's always that 30% I couldn't. But now with the new autofocus systems that I'm finding in the mirrorless and the subject tracking that they have built into them, my keeper rate's 90, 95% now on fast moving subjects. It just doesn't miss. So that's the amazing thing about it. Uh, and so ultimately, well, before I go any further, before I answer this question, and my nose is itching, by the way, we're starting to kind of come into springtime here, and I think every allergy allergen is in the air that affects me. Uh, Joanne says, $6,000 for a Z9. She says, whoa, think I'll pick up a D500 and a Fast 70 to 200 with that and my D850 and 
uh, and wait for the mirrorless switch. And that's just for that high-end camera, Joanne. If you want to go with the lesser expensive model, you can certainly do that. And they're, but they're again, they're the mirrorless are more expensive than the uh, than the DSLRs are. Uh, Bob asked the question: How much of a factor was the R5's higher resolution in your decision versus the R6? And is resolution an important factor? I, I think I would be telling you an untruth if I said that resolution wasn't a factor. But it wasn't the ultimate factor for me because uh, I am I am famous, at least in my own mind, for telling people that the best way to utilize a full frame sensor is to get as close as you can to the animals and figure out a way you can do that, especially when you're doing wildlife photography. I'm not one. Uh, I'm not one to uh, I try not to crop any more than I can because you pay a lot of money for the sensors. And I try to get as close as I can. So uh, if if I would have gotten a R3 that has, I think, what, 22, 23 megapixels, or I think R6 has about the same, uh, I, I could have used those cameras just as well as what I did the R5. I, I just switched, I just switched, picked the R5 because, one, they're re readily available at the time. And, uh, two, I just, I just wanted to go ahead and pick up the most advanced digital cameras mirrorless camera that Canon made at the time just to kind of get, you know, get my feet underneath me when it came to mirrorless. And so that's why I ultimately chose the R5 over the, over the R6. And then, uh, Joanne says Canon and Sony have the autofocus eye tracking system, but not Nikon. I correct. So some of you Nikon users, especially, uh, if you're still listening, tell, tell me about that. I think, I think Nikon has the eye tracking system. But I don't know that 100% for sure. But if you shoot Nikon, if you uh, uh, like Robert, for example, if you're still listening, tell us whether or not it has an eye tracking system. I'm assuming it does because I think most all the uh, most all the, the top manufacturers have built that in now. But I, I, I might be wrong about that. So, yeah, Patricia says it does have the to answer Joanne's question. It does has eye tracking. And then Rick said is it has eye tracking as well. So there you go. They all have eye tracking. Yep, there's more people coming in saying they have eye tracking. And so the ultimate question is, does it make sense to switch? I think at some point you're going to have to switch. I, I don't think there will be a uh, – I don't think there will be a uh, uh, a choice. I think that it's clear the manufacturers are all going – migrating towards mirrorless. At some point you're going to have to, but does it make switch, sense to switch now? At the end of the day, you got to remember that these mirrorless cameras are just a tool. And if you're good at using a, a DSLR as your tool, I mean, you can take good pictures of the DSLR as well as a mirrorless. And so for me, it was just trying to stay ahead of the curve from a business standpoint. And also, since I'm in the educational business, it made sense for me to stay ahead of the curve from an educational standpoint. Uh, but ultimately, I didn't have to switch to make better images. I was making good enough images with what I had. And had have made a good living off doing using DSLRs, uh, but to double down on my point from earlier, it since Canon has made it clear they're going to phase out of the uh, out of the EF system lenses, it I, I just went ahead and decided to to jump on board. And so far, I've been happy with my switch. I am a I'm a believer that rear that windshields are made bigger than rear view mirrors for a reason. That you're we're supposed to look forward and not look backwards, and so. With that singular thought in mind, I made the switch when I did. I've still kind of, I've got my foot in, in both places. I've still got a DSLR I carry with me, and I've still got most of my cameras are DSLRs, but I can see over time that I'll be slowly phasing those out. And as more R5s come onto the market, I'll buy more of those. And as the R3s come into the market, I'll probably, into the used market, I'll probably buy one of those. And when the, when the R1 comes out, that'll be sort of my flagship models that I use. Uh... Stephen makes a point. No need to switch. Lousy trading values. Keep old cameras and buy new. Uh, I think the point you're making is the point I was making earlier. The trading values on all of them are lousy. So, yeah, I, I think a good advice, not my advice, is sound. If you're going to make the switch, do it slowly. Buy, buy a new camera. Uh, buy a new mirrorless camera. Keep your old DSLRs because they still work fine and kind of phase into it over time, I think, is the smart thing to do. And Rick corrected me. The uh, uh, 
the R the Z9 is 5500 not $6000 so I missed I missed it by 500 bucks but uh when you're talking that much money I don't I don't know that 500 makes a huge difference so any other questions so far from anybody at all and I'll wait a second cuz I know that there's about a 5 second lag time between when I say something and you hear it so uh we'll uh I'll wait for a few questions to come in. I got a couple more pieces of uh, information for you as I go along, if, if you're interested in seeing that. So stick with me for a second. And we're right on time. It's 101. I'm getting pretty good at finishing these on time. Uh, yeah, Robert just said that the Z, Z62 and the Z72 and Z9 all have eye tracking. So he confirmed that for the one, for Joanne who asked that question earlier about eye tracking and icon. Okay, so here's one of the things you may be interested in. I did about a 15-minute video on my thoughts uh, on on my on making the switch to mirrorless and uh, and using the R5. It's kind of R5 specific and what I like about it. But the thing about the R5 is it's got many of the same features that uh, the, that the camera Z72 has, that the uh, Sony's have, that the Olympus has. So it's it's even though. It's, I'm talking about the camera I bought for me and why I like it so far. There's still a, it's, I think a lot of the things I talk about are cross brand compatible. So uh, if you're interested in that, that video is going to be coming out this week. All you got to do is go to wildlifephotoshow.com. I don't spam you with a bunch of emails, but I do let all the people who sign up there know when a new video is out and you're the first ones to know about it. And uh, before it goes over onto my YouTube channel. Uh, but anyway, you can go to wildlifephotoshow.com, type your email address in. Again, I don't spam you with a bunch of stuff you don't need to know. I just let you know when new videos come out. Uh, and then uh, one more thing, and I've got a few more questions coming in. All, oops. Hang on. Hang on just a second. I accidentally went one too far. Anyway, so what I, what I was going to say earlier was, let me share the screen again. I accidentally shut that off. So if you want to, uh, after this is over, if you have any other questions, you want to contact me, there's my contact address, uh, russell at russellgraves.com. Sometimes it may take me a day or two to answer you, but I always answer questions, so any questions or comments since we're once we're done let me know and then i will uh but again there's my contact information russell at russellgraves.com so uh got a few more questions coming in here thank you joanne for your comments there she was thanking me for the for the uh my thoughts on today's webinar uh drew asked other than your high keeper rate as a pro wildlife photographer do you find the most advantages of the of the mirrorless uh no I, not really i think i think really for me the biggest advantage is the higher keeper rate now i know the 1d mark 4 if i was to buy it uh it's got a similar autofocus as the r5 has so i could get a high keeper right there but no i think really from the, the two things that are advantageous to me i like the 8k video and i like the high the the uh, autofocus on the camera. So I think those are the two main components for me, but you know, I mean, I was at, at one time I was shooting pro level pictures uh, with a cheaper camera. And so there's always that it just helps make the, it doesn't make the work better. It just makes the job more efficient. And that's what it does for me. Uh, Glenn says, I currently use a 5D Mark IV with a battery grip. My only reason to switch right now would be weight. Do you have any thoughts on that combination? Uh, a 5D Mark IV with a battery grip. I don't know the exact weight of it, but I can tell you, having used that setup before, it's going to be heavier than like an R5 or an R6 with a battery grip, just because the camera is a little bit bigger physically. So, uh, but that combination you've got is a good one. And then uh, Stan asked, "Hey Stan, hope you're doing well." He asked, "Have you ever tried any of the RF lenses? If so, thoughts?" Yeah, in fact, I've got. Let me reach over here. This is my one of my RF lenses I bought, and it's right there. 
it's an 800 millimeter lens, but it's f11. And at first you may think, who in the world wants to use an f11 lens? And that's what I thought when I first bought this lens. But my second thought was, it's like 800 bucks, and so how can you go wrong on spinning that? So I bought the lens, and what I surmised, and I've got a video coming out about that lens too. What I surmised was it from a wildlife standpoint or a birds in flight standpoint, if you're shooting birds against blue skies flying in, the the depth of field really doesn't matter. And as much as I want to think about uh, shooting stuff at like F5.6 to get that really shallow depth of field, when you're shooting against the blue sky, it doesn't matter anyway. And so I bought that lens right before I went to Bosque del Apache in December. And all the thoughts I had about it doesn't really matter if you're shooting against the blue sky proved true. The best thing about it is it's 800 millimeters. It's super hand holdable. And I found that I was able to shoot pictures of birds in flight a little bit better than I did with my big lens, my big 500 millimeter F4. Uh, I've also seen the one to 500 lens that I've used a few times uh, that guests have loaned me when they're not using it. And that's a pretty capable lens as too. Uh, let's see. Irene says she doesn't see my contact info. Let me know. I can see it on my, on my preview screen. Well, maybe not. Hang on just a second. Let me. One, give me one second. Let me try to change something. Maybe I didn't hit it right. Let me switch screen. Okay, maybe that's, maybe you couldn't see it. There we go. I think you can see it now. So there's my contact info, Irene, if you couldn't see it. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. She said it was helpful in doing the research. Uh, Robert says, what? lenses do I take to cat my to do weight restrictions I'll typically carry my 500 millimeter f4 lens Robert which is a heavy lens but I like that lens and it's uh it's it's been good to me so I'll take it along with me and really on the on the weight restrictions uh here's what I tell people and people may not want to hear this but it's just the absolute truth if you've got to save weight going to cat my don't take a lot of clothes because I mean if especially if you're doing a photo tour Every, it's kind of a shared misery everybody's in and I don't mean misery in a bad way but you know you're you're not sweating a lot that time of year it's the weather is usually pretty pretty agreeable uh and so if you just carry like one or you know carry carry underwear and socks and but your outer stuff don't worry about changing it every day that's that's how I save weight I'd rather bring camera gear than weight another thing I do is instead of bringing a tripod with me which I'm I'm religious about using the tripod, but I'll bring a monopod with me to save weight there as well. Uh, and then I hope that answers that question. Drew says, uh, so appreciate my thoughts. Appreciate that, Drew. Currently have an 850 and looking to switch. Switch. Uh, pieces on the list to, to get a Z9. I think you'll be happy. Uh, again, I've been happy. Uh Uh, Glenn, I forgot your comment, but she said, or he said, you should clarify my use is 90% landscape. Uh, Drew says, can't see the contact info, but I think I fixed that part. And then uh, Irene says, I think she got the contact info, so you should be able to see it. Again, two things. Uh, I'll go back and share with you again. I'm going to be having some, some, uh, mirrorless specific conversations if you go to that wildlifephotoshow.com and sign up for that i'll i'll triple down on it don't spam you don't add you to any kind of sales list i just let people know uh you're the first ones to know when you sign up that a new that a new uh, video is coming out so and then there's my contact info there if you want to contact me about anything after the after the fact so uh I think I have answered all the questions. I'll kind of stall here for another 30 seconds or a minute. If anyone else has any other questions that I can get to, I'd be, be glad to answer them again. If you think of something after the fact and want to follow up with me later on, feel free to send me an email. But uh, uh, as I wind this down in the end, let me say thanks again for, for joining us or joining me on today's webinar. Uh, I always enjoy doing these things. The, the, when you're uh, 
I live in a small, well, I don't live in a town. I live out in the country, but in the small town with which I, in which I live, you're looking at the entire photography enthusiast community of the area. So anytime I get a chance to talk photography with people, I always enjoy. And I, you know, I hope you enjoyed my views on everything. I, I may not be right. That's the cool thing about photography. There's a million different ways to skin a cat, as we say in Texas. And so it's just really trying to figure out what works for you and what works best for you. And I always just share kind of what works best for me and what works, what's worked best for me for a long time. Uh, got a few more comments coming in. Linda says, does the R6 have the eye focus tracking like the R5, but less resolution? I believe that's right, Linda. Uh, Bob says, great presentation. Appreciate that, Bob. Thank you for listening. And then uh, Drew says, top of his bucket list is Grizzlies in Alaska. Can you see the mirrorless being much more advantageous for a DSLR like an 850 while fishing at Brooks or on Kodiak? Not really. I mean, when you go to Katmai, most of those bears you're going to see are moving, you know, they're moving pretty slow. I mean, my keeper right there with the mirrorless is pretty high. They just don't move around that fast. In fact, if you go to Katmai in the fall and watch them fishing from the, uh, from the falls, they're almost stationary most of the time. They're just sitting there waiting for fish to come by them. So uh, most action you'll get in Katmai. And when, when I do trips there and I'm doing, I think, two or three this summer, when I do trips there, most of the action that we get there is is when the bears are are fishing on the river, and so we'll go down to the river and wade with them and try to get shots at them at eye level. And uh, a little more action there, but even when they're kind of bouncing through the water, they're not moving super fast. So an 850 will handle that, an R5 will handle that, a, a Rebel XTI will handle that. So all kinds of cameras can handle that because that's not a super technical shoot. Uh, and then appreciate the comment there, Glenn. Well, I, I want to say this again, appreciate everybody coming out. Be looking at the uh, backcountry journeys list on the webinars coming out. I think it, I think it's, a, I'm, I'm, I think it's a couple of weeks. I'll be doing a, a wildlife image review uh, webinar. And then I, I know I've got several webinars coming up. because I, I do a lot of these webinars for backcountry journeys. So uh, all that's coming up uh, again, enjoy everyone. And their, uh, and their comments. We had a lot of great comments today. And thanks for clarification on the things I was weak on because, you know, I, I don't certainly don't know everything there is to know about photography and particularly the camera manufacturers. So I really appreciate people who chimed in on, on what the cameras they're experts on and helping me answer the, some of those questions. So that's always appreciated. And uh, yeah, feel free to come back again and ask me any questions you want to ask me. And I'll look forward to hearing from you guys soon. Take care.